Now, perhaps in a related matter, and perhaps we focus back to the region in APAC, uh, what is your view on China in general? I mean, given the problems facing the housing market in China, some would argue that perhaps there are limited tools at the Chinese government's disposal to help stimulate the economy there. Do you agree with that? And what is your general assessment for Chinese economy? Well, generally speaking, I don't think we can apply the rules that would apply in the West to China. And the simple reason for that is that the Chinese Communist Party is in charge of the economy. If they want to print more money, they'll print more money. If they want to lower interest rates, they'll lower interest rates. In other words, this is a party controlled state. Now, what does that mean? It means, first of all, that the housing crisis that we see in China with the huge debts will be solved because the Communist Party will instruct their banks to make loans to bail out these real estate companies. The same thing is true of the Belt and Road projects. As you know, the Belt and Road has enormous debts. Now, the Chinese government has loaned uh, enormous amounts of money to countries like Pakistan, Sri Lanka, uh, many African countries, and so forth. Uh, this means that the debts on the balance sheets of uh, Chinese banks is very high. But there will be no problem because the Chinese government will just instruct uh, the central bank to print more money, to print more renminbi. And as you know, they control uh, the interest rate. So uh, yes, China is slowing, which is expected because you must remember, okay, 10 years ago, China was growing at 10%. Now it's growing in single digit, maybe less, uh, but it's a bigger economy. It's a much larger economy. So a 1% increase in the Chinese com economy today is bigger than the 10% increase 10 10 years ago. So uh, I don't, I'm not uh, very alarmed by uh, the situation in China. It's a problem. There's big debts that they have to overcome. But at the end of the day, because of the control by the Communist Party, uh, they will be able to uh, make changes that are required. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mobius, you mentioned uh, India multiple times on your recent interviews as the relative bright spot within emerging markets. Uh, do you still stick to that view? And uh, if, you, if you don't mind sharing some, I suppose, the uh, value access of such, for such constructive uh, view, that would be great. Yeah, uh, India is uh, an incredible growth story. Uh, India is now growing at uh, 9, 10% that were the highest growth rates of the major countries in the world today. And the reason for that is that the country is going through a, a total transforma transformation as a result of the uh, policies by uh, uh, Modi. Uh, he has instituted uh, rationalization of government offices, and he has introduced more and more digitization of the economy. That's one thing. The other thing is that India is blessed by a young population. The average age in India is about 26, whereas the average age in China now is something like 36 and getting worse. It's getting older in China. You're getting an aging population. So the growth prospects for India are very, very good. And of course, you've got over a billion people, which means the local market is enormous. So they have the chance to really become a great leader. And they are, of course, as I mentioned uh, many times, we are very positive on India. Dr. Mobius, you partly answered my next question already, but again, given your ability to make long-term calls, I wonder whether you see any specific opportunities globally. I think I narrowed the discussion to perhaps emerging markets in Asia, but if you take a step back and take a more of a global perspective, in this environment where the perceived risk level is very high, do you see any good uh, specific opportunity um, areas or um, I guess uh, uh, asset class that can be asset classes or specific instruments, but I would love to hear your view, please. Uh, yes, I would say that uh, in Korea, for example, uh, there are great opportunities in the tech area, because as you know, a lot of the tech companies have come down dramatically. And you know, people look at the the tech index and they say, oh gee, uh, tech is over. No, there are bad companies and good companies. 
And there are many terrific tech companies that have a high return of capital, have the pricing power and so forth. So I would say Korea, Taiwan is at, at the top of our list. Uh, I believe that the Taiwan companies are doing very well and will continue to do well. So there's a great opportunity there. And then down south in Indonesia, uh, Indonesia is a place uh, that deserves another look uh, more cautiously. But uh, in our portfolio, we're finding individual companies in places that may seem to be quite disastrous. For example, if you look at Turkey, uh, Turkey's uh, exchange rate has plummeted. Uh, but there are a number of good companies there that are surviving because their costs are in Turkish lira and they're exporting in US dollars. So uh, individual companies can be found, but I would say at this stage of the game, uh, there are lots of opportunities in Asia. Dr. Mobius, retail investors in general are desperately looking for certain, I suppose, um, benchmarks or signals that would give be potentially foretelling of an inflection point in the market, or at least the finding the bottom um, uh, signal. Obviously, we've heard, uh, at least I've heard, multiple different benchmarks, such as when the Fed rate reaches, or the Fed funds rate, or the 10-year Treasury reaches a certain level, that is typically the inflection point potentially. Or the peak to trough sell-off reaches a certain range commensurate to the previous, um, I suppose, uh, great sell-offs that we've seen, such as the financial crisis, maybe that is the benchmark. And there are all sorts of different parameters being, I suppose, proposed by different market participants. But in your perspective, and given your decades of experience, what would you guide the retail investors to in terms of a signal to watch out for? Well, the first thing you've got to look out for is uh, uh, the attitude of the market generally. In other words, when everyone is despondently selling, in other words, when they have given up, they say, look, I'm fed up, I'm never gonna go into the market again, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, when your friends are telling you that, that's probably the best time to invest. Yeah. And we're not there yet. Uh, as you know, there's still people that are optimistic uh, that have not given up. Uh, so I would say, if you look at the overall market, you have to look for that kind of psychological scenario. Mm. The second thing you have to look at is the, uh, the interest rate uh, at this, in this environment. Although I said interest rates don't necessarily mean a bear market, but the increase in interest rates in America to uh, seven, eight, nine percent could signal probably the end mm. uh, of uh, the bear market. And the third thing to look at is the price of uh, Bitcoin. As you know, Bitcoin is the leading cryptocurrency. And as I mentioned, uh, there's an incredible amount of trading going on in cryptocurrencies that are making people rich. Uh, once cryptocurrency goes far below where it is now, that will be a signal that we are now in capitulation. In other words, we have to look for capitulation in the market. Dr. Mobius, what is your current portfolio strategy, if I may ask? I've heard multiple different equity market participants, institutional portfolio managers sharing with me how they have completely pivoted away from growth stocks because growth is difficult to find and high growth, I suppose a growth expectation built in stocks typically tend to command high valuation multiples. And therefore, it, it seems to me, uh, bulk of the institutional investor community have now polarized towards the more the defensive strategy, and I suppose a more valuation of, I guess, affordability parameter satisfying segments or whatnot. I, I wonder how you are weathering the current or how your portfolio strategy is positioned in this current environment, and whether you see this to be a very different requiring a different investment manual versus in the past, perhaps? Well, first of all, we do not differentiate between growth and value. Uh, we believe that if you want to invest successfully, you've got to have both. In other words, you've got to have companies that are good value, but are also growing. 
So I would uh, say that our philosophy, very simply put, of course, we look at many factors, but I would say uh, there are three things we look at when we're uh, considering investing in a company. First of all, the balance sheet. We want a company that has very low debt and maybe no debt, uh, usually a debt equity of below 50%. Second thing we look at is earnings per share growth over a five-year period. It should be more than 10%, in dollars, by the way. And the third thing we look at is the, uh, the return on capital. In other words, if a company has a really high return on capital, chances are they're going to have very low debt anyway. And chances are, in any kind of crisis, they will survive because they have pricing power. Mm. So these are the things we look at. Now, of course, at the end of the day, when we start digging into looking at a company, we look at the ESG factors, the environmental factors, the governance factors, and the social factors, uh, which are very important. Not only because investors want to see us investing in these kinds of high ESG companies, but because it increases the safety. In other words, we want companies that are not going to be involved in any environmental disaster, don't have strikes, and uh, treat the shareholders well. Mm. So these are the things we look at. And uh, as I said, we don't really differentiate between value and growth because we want both. Dr. Movies, that's very helpful. Um, perhaps one last question for you, just because I have to ask, what are your thoughts on gold currently? Um, I, I've heard you speak about gold, um, and I know you have a very distinct view on gold as an asset class. Uh, and there is, I, I sense a lot of interest from the retail investors in Korea as an example, whether that is a destination to park their assets. Um, and perhaps if you don't mind sharing your thoughts. Uh, yes, I believe that everyone should have gold. And uh, it's not necessarily as uh, a, a good performing asset in terms of appreciation. Although if you look at the history of gold, uh, gold has continued to rise in price in US dollar terms over the years. But the reason why you have gold is because of safety. At the end of the day, if things are falling apart and there's a crisis, having gold in your possession is a good safe thing to have because you can uh, buy things with gold when the currency has depreciated incredibly. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, right now, if you look at the Ukraine situation, those Ukrainians who were able to escape from Ukraine with gold are in a much better position than those that did not have gold. Mm -hmm. So I would say, uh, don't look at gold as necessarily a high performing investment, but look at as a safety valve uh, of means to uh, escape a very critical situation. So maybe 5% of your assets, 10% of your assets in gold. Mm. Dr. Mobius, one final very difficult question for you, if you don't mind. You have earlier mentioned that there is more pain to be had in this market. I think um, most in the audience here will agree to that as well. Now, is there any way to quantify that downside? How severe of a downside do you anticipate? And um, if, if there is some... I suppose you share with us how to uh, look for and look out for potential signals of um, inflection point earlier, but is, is there some quantifiable benchmark or how severe that pain may be um, that you can share with us? Yeah. Well, I would say another 10% roughly is what you would want to expect. Um, and a 10%, you must notice a lot of the indices are at a support level. And once that uh, support level breaks down by about 10%, then there'll be uh, this, uh, this uh, surrender, let's say, of participants in the market. And people will then begin to sell very despondently. So I would say that's probably you know, a signal, another 10%.